It's the Sound of Ideas from Ideastream Public Media. I'm Jenny Hamill. Thanks so much for joining us. This week, Ohioans voted in a historic off-year election, which included the passage of a constitutional amendment enshrining reproductive rights and a statute that legalizes recreational marijuana. Today, we're going to dig into the weeds of issue two, pun intended, as Ohio becomes the 24th state to legalize marijuana for adults 21 and over. The law will take effect 30 days after the election date, but Republican state lawmakers have been signaling even before the election that they intend to alter the statute if it passes. Here to tell us more about the new law and next steps for recreational marijuana in Ohio, we're joined in studio by Tom Heron, spokesperson for the Coalition to Regulate Marijuana Like Alcohol. Tom, so glad to have you. Good morning, Jenny. Thank you for having me. Good morning. We also have by phone from Columbus, Megan Henry, reporter for Ohio Capital Journal, who has been following this issue. Welcome, Megan. Hello. Thank you for having me. Glad to have you. If you'd like to join the conversation with a question or a thought, you can call 866-578-0903 or 216-578-0903. You can email us at soi at ideastream.org or you can tweet us. We are at Sound of Ideas. All right, Tom, this was not the first effort to legalize recreational marijuana. There was an attempt in 2015, a group called Responsible Ohio tried and failed. What in your mind was different about this year's campaign and why do you think ultimately it was successful? So I I think there were a couple of major differences. Number one, 2015 was a lifetime ago. Uh, In marijuana years, uh, a lot has changed in the eight years since Responsible Ohio was on the ballot. You know, we've seen Michigan, for example, implement an adult use framework. And a lot of Ohioans, I think they traveled to Michigan. They've been to Illinois. They've been to Colorado. They've been to a lot of these states that have regulated adult use programs. And they got to see firsthand how successful those programs were. And in addition, Since 2015, we also have implemented a very safe and reliable medical marijuana program here in Ohio. So again, Ohioans got to see firsthand that we know how to safely regulate the production and sale of marijuana products. The same reefer madness scare tactics that our opponents tried to throw at us this year, they said those same things back in 2016, and none of their dire predictions proved true. So we think uh, from an electorate standpoint, Ohio voters are more familiar with what regulated programs look like. And also, the policy behind issue two is dramatically better than what Responsible Ohio tried to put in place in 2015. I mean, we're building off of an existing regulatory framework that will allow new entrepreneurs to enter the adult use market. And we have this system set up that really we think will be a best in class model as it relates to the regulation of adult use marijuana. Megan, you were at an issue two watch party on Tuesday. Were people confident about getting enough votes? And was there general consensus that this issue might pass? Or do you think it was kind of a nail biter um, um, until votes started really coming in in mass? Yeah, I got the sense that Uh, The issue was going to pass, just a question really of how much it was going to pass by, since with marijuana, it's not a strictly Republican or Democratic issue. Um, Republicans uh, and Democrats alike both support it uh, and also some oppose it. So uh, I was confident that it was going to pass. I think a lot of other reporters I was with were also confident it would pass. Um, I think initially when um, the vote started being counted and tabulated in uh, in different precincts, we were a little surprised at how close out of the gate it was um, compared to issue one, uh, which had a wide margin for most of the night, and then ultimately when it was called. Uh, So we were, I think, a little surprised initially at how close it was, but then once issue one was called, we knew it was going to be a matter of time before issue two was going to be called as well. And um, ultimately, I mean, were there certain parts of the states that really pushed this through or have you kind of seen a play by play in different counties in Ohio? Yeah, it's been a good mix. Um, Athens County 
Home of Ohio University uh, had the highest passage rate, and then um, the, th- the three big counties, Franklin, Cuyahoga, and Hamilton. Uh, but it was a good mix of uh, more rural counties uh, as well. And so there really, it was hard to pinpoint a trend per se. Um, it was really kind of across the board uh, when it comes to which counties voted for for what. It was uh, 40 counties voted in favor of issue two and 48 counties voted against it. So, Tom, without any major changes uh, being implemented by our legislature within the next, what now, 29 days, uh, what can Ohioans expect? Um, You know, let's say suddenly a dispensary is open. um, What legally can they acquire? How can they use? What are some of the logistics of um, this new legal landscape for recreational weed? So uh, under issue two, obviously it becomes law 30 days after the election. So on December 7th, issue two will formally take effect. That kicks off a rulemaking process at the Department of Commerce to put in place the rules that are required under issue two to govern the operation of adult use dispensaries, packaging, labeling, advertising rules, all of those good things. Um, Within six months from December 7th, so sometime in May of 2024, the department should start accepting license applications Mm -hmm. for the new round of adult use dispensaries, including the 40 new social equity cultivator licenses and 50 new social equity dispensary licenses. And then within nine months, the department is charged with completing its rulemaking process and actually issuing the first round of adult use licenses. They may take some time to complete construction or to rehab existing facilities, but we should have an opportunity in Ohio to purchase adult use marijuana products if you're over the age of 21 before the end of the year next year. Okay, so to be clear, the law goes into effect in 30 days, but the the realities of someone getting a license, opening up a dispensary, uh, going through the bureaucracy of uh, making sure this is uh, abiding by the law, and someone being able to purchase uh, marijuana in whatever form you don't think will happen for... For several months. I mean, look, Rome wasn't built in a day, right? right? The department is developing and putting rules in place for a brand new regulatory framework. I mean, a lot of the existing rules in the medical marijuana program will certainly translate to the adult use program, a lot of the same security rules, those sorts of things. But this is a, you know, it's a little bit of a lift for our friends at the Department of Commerce. So I know they're going to be working hard over the next couple of months. And Megan, under this law, medical marijuana cultivation sites will be able to tap into the recreational market. I'm assuming a lot of those medical marijuana whether they're farms or dispensaries will just kind of transfer into the recreational marijuana space. What does that mean for Ohioans from an economic standpoint? Yeah, uh, you kind of hit the nail on the head. I think a lot of the medical marijuana dispensaries and cultivation sites are just going to kind of try to you know slide into the recreational um Use, but it it can mean a lot of money uh, for the state. Um, Before the election, uh, a recent study from Ohio State University Drug and Enforcement Policy Center estimated the potential annual tax revenue from legalizing marijuana uh, ranges from uh, $276 million to $403 million in the fifth year of an operational cannabis market. So uh, years from now, we could really see... um, quite a boost uh, in the state's revenue. Let's go ahead and take a call from Scott. He's calling in from Oberlin this morning. Scott, thanks for calling into the Sound of Ideas. Hey, folks. Uh, Fantastic show. Uh, The cannabis issue has something that I've campaigned on for over a decade. Uh, I was in some of those early efforts that uh, your get your uh, your guest was talking about uh, back with the old Ohio Rights Group that uh, John and Linda Pardee organized. Uh, and I've been down in the state house. I've talked to senators and representatives over the years. My question: It's like, and we're talking. You guys have been talking specifically about medical and uh and recreational cannabis marijuana and everything i'm calling on a question concerning industrial hemp so this is the third leg of the triad of the cannabis plant so this is the industrial seed and the indust and the fiber crop that has no thc whatsoever uh i want to know if i'm going to be able to grow a hemp crop uh 
on my on my in my garden plot and then harvest the seed and then use the fiber and what I would have to do for that and can I as my friends in Canada and England and other places can go they can go to their grocery store buy live seed and then plant it in their gardens um, but in the United States the, the the whole seed that we buy here has been sterilized so that it does not grow anymore. all right so all right, great question. Let's uh, go to Tom with some of those answers. Yeah, so issue two doesn't really address Ohio's hemp laws. Um, that's all governed by the Ohio Hemp Act, which Ohio put in place about four years now. So industrial hemp cultivation, processing of industrial hemp products, those are all governed by a completely different statute, different set of rules. Pre-existing. Pre-existing. So Scott can go find out all of that out right now. Th- that's right. So if anybody has questions about cultivating hemp or getting a hemp cultivation license, all they have to do is reach out to the Ohio Department of Agriculture and their hemp program. And the folks there, they're super nice. They'd be happy to answer your questions. Okay. Let's go to Terry calling from uh, Cleveland Heights. Terry, good morning. Hi, how are you? Congratulations, John, on your new job. Oh, I well, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. It's been a blast, and uh, I'm really excited to be here. Oh, we're excited to have you. Um, my question, you already answered one of them, but the other one is um, about current, um, you know, medical marijuana shops. I know they have pharmacists and everything on board, and um, so I was just going to wonder wondering what what's going to happen to them <laughs> all right tom do you want to take that Sure. So existing medical marijuana dispensaries will have an ability to apply and to get a commensurate adult use dispensary license at that location. The whole idea is that from a consumer or patient standpoint, you're going to be able to go into the same retail dispensary, buy a lot of the same products. The only real difference being, do you have a current medical marijuana recommendation? Or are you going to purchase that product through the adult use market and pay that 10% tax at the point of sale? There will be some products that are really only available on the adult use side that are not available on the medical side. But from a consumer and patient-facing standpoint, the idea is that this is a smooth transition and that there's a lot of synthesis between the medical and adult use side. All right, Megan, let's go to these uh, changes that top Republican lawmakers in Ohio are promising when it comes to issue two and the statute as written currently. Uh, Why don't you tell us uh, what we might expect are going to be attempted changes by Republican lawmakers before this goes into effect? Yes, Republican lawmakers were quick to release statements uh, Tuesday night. Um, Ohio House Speaker Jason Stevens, um, in his statement, hinted at uh, figuring out how to best allocate uh, tax revenues while regulating the industry. So maybe looking into changes in the tax revenue. Uh, And then Ohio Senate President Matt Huffman uh, said in his statement that it may The General Assembly may amend the statute to clarify the uh, language regarding limits for THC and tax rates, as well as other parts of the statute. Uh, Ohio Governor Mike DeWine, uh, who has uh, been outspokenly against legalizing marijuana, has yet to say anything, uh, a public statement uh, regarding the election on issue one or issue two, but he has at a a press conference later this morning, so I expect uh, him to make some kind of comments uh, as well. So some potential changes uh, there with with the tax rates and some of the language and THC, it sounds like. All righty, Tom, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I I just want to say it's sort of shocking to me that in 2023, we're talking about legislators not wanting to accept the outcome of an election, particularly a decisive sort of landslide election where issue two passed by over 14 points. So I think every voter has a right to expect that legislators will respect their decision uh, on issue two. I mean, they passed it overwhelmingly. Um, But I also really want to point out, let's be clear about what these legislators are, are saying. They're not talking about repealing issue two. They're not talking about stopping the rollout of an adult use program. They're really talking at this point more about tinkering uh, around the edges with issue two. And and I think that is really an important recognition um, that this, again, was a a decisive outcome uh, at the ballot on Tuesday. But expectations that that even though, you know, the will of the, the, the people has been, um, you know, kind of enacted on Tuesday that there might be changes? I, 
We'll see. Okay. Um, I, you know, I, I think it, emotions always run high. Sure. After elections, I mean, you always hear after whatever the race is, people are still amped up, and it, it takes some time. Uh, for temperatures to cool down. Okay, let's talk about something that's really important. You know, we historically have, um, you know, come down hard on people for drug violations. And as a part of uh, making recreational marijuana law, there have been promises to kind of rectify some of the past when it comes, especially when it comes to black and brown folks who've been um, kind of prosecuted more vigorously than their white counterparts when it comes to marijuana. Um, What about expungement and what happens to people with existing marijuana-related violations? So under Ohio law, every citizen-initiated proposal is limited to what's known as a single subject. And that's really important as you're crafting any citizen-initiated proposal, because uh, if it's determined that you have more than a, than one subject as part of that proposal, you got to gather double the number of signatures. You have m- multiple questions on the ballot, all of which need to pass in order for the proposal to take effect. So uh, under issue two, we had to be really laser focused on number one ending marijuana prohibition I mean which in and of itself is maybe one of the largest developments as it relates to social equity uh, in the state Uh, and then setting up this regulatory framework so that we can allow consumers to have an alternative to the illicit market so unfortunately we couldn't include automatic expungements or automatic sealing of records but what we did is under the social equity and jobs fund uh, which it gets 30 percent of the new tax revenue generated under issue two you know to the tune of eventually over $140 million every year, a lot of that money will go to study and fund really important criminal justice reform efforts like expungement, sealing of records, sentencing reform, uh, to, to make proposals to remedy the effects of decades of marijuana prohibition. So we tried to address that through the Social Equity and Jobs Program Fund. Uh, and as you know, o- Ohio has also opened up the ability to get records sealed over the last several years. Tom Heron, spokesperson for the Coalition to Regulate Marijuana Like Alcohol, and Megan Henry, reporter for the Ohio Capital Journal, who's been following this issue. Thank you both for joining me for this conversation this morning. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Time now for a quick break, but on the other side, we'll learn about a new anthology from Literary Cleveland that tells the stories of our veterans. This is The Sound of Ideas. I'm Jenny Hamill. We'll be right back. At 924, it's the Sound of Ideas right here on WKSU, Idea Stream Public Media. Thanks for being with us for part of your Thursday morning, November the 9th. Support for WKSU comes from you, the listener, as well as these following organizations. Levin Furniture and Mattress. For over 100 years, Levin Furniture and Mattress has been offering a variety of mattress brands, including Tempur-Pedic, Purple, and Stearns and Foster, with manufacturer warranties and complimentary next-day delivery. More at levinfurniture.com. The University of Akron. Students can choose from five programs, including business law, economics, history, and philosophy, to earn both bachelor's and juris doctor degrees in six years. Learn more at uakron.edu. The Cleveland Museum of Art, inviting visitors to Degas and the Laundress. This exhibition focuses on representations of Parisian laundresses by Degas, Renoir, Picasso, and more, united for the first time, now through January 14th. Tickets at cma.org. Margaret W. Wong & Associates, providing a range of immigration services for companies and individuals, with attorneys and staff who speak English, Spanish, Mandarin, and many more languages. Learn more at imwong.com. You're with the Sound of Ideas from Ideastream Public Media. I'm Jenny Hamill. Thanks so much for staying with us this hour. It's easy to think of how different the experiences of a writer or poet and someone serving in the armed forces can seem like. We imagine the writer pouring the emotions onto the page, sharing experiences with the world, and the soldier maybe a bit more buttoned up in a uniform, having to go into really tenuous situations. But across the country, writing workshops have been teaming up with Veterans Affairs offices to get veterans to tell their stories and to get their feelings down on the page. 
Literary Cleveland recently released their first Veterans Voices Anthology, Celebrating Service, stemming from a series of writing workshops aimed at helping vets not only to reinforce their positive experiences they had in the service, but also to tap into and share some of the more painful experiences and emotions they've had. As we mark the celebration of Veterans Day this weekend, we wanted to spend some time discussing this new anthology. Joining me in studio now to discuss Celebrating Service 2023 Veterans Voices Anthology from Literary Cleveland is <clears throat> Mansa Bay, a veteran and writer who wrote for the anthology and the Veterans Voices Project Leader. Mansa, welcome to The Sound of Ideas. Oh, thanks for having me. Thank you. Of course. Right. Also here is Michelle Smith, the Programming Director for Literary Cleveland. Michelle, thanks for being here as well. Thank you so much for having me. All righty. We also have Jeremy Stream. Uh, he's a health and wellness coach for the Whole Health Initiative at the VA Northeast Ohio Healthcare System. Also a contributor to the anthology. Jeremy, thanks so much for joining us. Hey, thank you for having me as well. And we have Deborah Gibson. Gibson also joining us. She's another one of the Veterans Voices anthology participant and contributor. Deborah, welcome to you. Hello, thank you for having me. Yeah, glad to have all of you here this morning. And uh, Jeremy, Jeremy, you on the line. If you'd like to join the conversation or have a question for our guests, 866-578-0903 or 216-578-0903. You can email us at soi at ideastream.org or you can tweet us. We are at Sound of Ideas. So Mansa, you're the project leader for this. Um, can you first talk about your experience at a veteran, and how that led you to ultimately want to uh, organize this anthology project. Oh, okay. Well, uh, I'm a veteran of the Ohio National Guard. Uh, I served in Baghdad as a military police officer in 2003. So my experience as a National Guardsman in Baghdad, Iraq, patrolling the the city, downtown, the neighborhoods, I became a poet uh, as a way to help me stay grounded in, you know, war, <laughs> in war. So coming back home, um, I wrote every day. I wrote every day and it was something that helped me. So once you got back here? Once I got back here in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, I went through a lot of different changes in terms of just dealing with alienation and moving from here to there because, you know, I joined to pay for college. That was the wow. only reason why I joined. But my last year I ended up getting activated. So, um, you know, the writing helped me. I wrote every day for the for. T it's ever since I've been home, I eventually became a social worker and started working with the Department of Veterans Affairs. And in one of the uh, trainings that we had, they talked about veterans killing themselves, committing suicide. Mm. 21, 22 a day was back in 2016. I remember I that statistic. Yeah. yeah. So from that, um, as a writer, as a poet, uh, I decided to develop a workshop called Veterans Voice. Now, I've done Veterans Voice outside of Literary Cleveland, maybe once or twice. But then, you know, Literary Cleveland is a whole machine in terms of marketing and promotion sure. and just having that platform. So, you know, I've been working with Literary Cleveland um, for a while now, facilitating the workshop. So the whole idea is to use our voice as a way to connect with our experience as soldiers and as veterans mm -hmm. and own that experience. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the times we forget that, you know, although our time in the military is only a certain amount of time, our veteran, our lives as veterans is something that is lifelong. And we have these ideas, these thoughts and memories for the rest of our lives. So that is something Thing, just as a therapeutic nature of it. But then talking with other veterans, you know, other veterans said, well, my experience wasn't as traumatic. So it's just talking about that military sure. experience. Yeah. Michelle, Literary Cleveland puts on a variety of anthologies and yes. puts on a number of workshops. So how did the organization approach this specific type of project working with veterans? And was that different than when you were working with other groups? 
Well, in 2021, we developed a new series of programming called Amplify. And what we really wanted to do was to give a lot of concerted attention and effort to developing workshops and uh, putting out publications that amplify marginalized voices, groups that we don't always get to hear from, um, groups that have really important and meaningful stories that need to be told. Um, And the idea being that we can get these stories out into the community. We can make the community sort of better for everybody, right? Uh, And also to help these people who are writing, who are in these groups, to develop their skills, to, you know, to sort of enter into the community of writers, into literary community and creative community. And one of the first projects we did was Voices from the Edge, where uh, in the pandemic, we designed a workshop where essential workers who were on the front line were able to come together to form a community to do what Manta was talking about, to write about that experience or to sort of process together and to tell their stories. Because I think for those of us who were sort of sheltering in place and going out, we maybe didn't understand the sort of profundity of what these people were going sure. through. And we needed to, you know, sort of have that communion between uh, the, the two sort of groups. We were kind of isolated and separated until it brought all of that together. And so that sort of became the model for us, a way for us to understand what this veterans uh, workshop needed to be, that it needed to be the same sort of space where people could bring their stories, they can process, they can develop as writers, they can grow, but also create community. And it was very important for us that in doing that, we created a means for these stories to sort of get out into the greater Mm -hmm. sort of community to become part of a bigger conversation Mm -hmm. about what it means to be a veteran, what it means to serve this country. Like you said, the idea of veterans are veterans for life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the service is one thing, but sort of carrying that is a really sort of, you know, it's a deep thing Mm -hmm. and something that we all need to understand in order to be, you know, good neighbors, good family members, good friends to our veterans. Jeremy, tell us a little bit about how the whole health initiative at the VA of North uh, East Ohio has evolved and how are we as a society looking at veterans' health differently and uh, maybe ho- more holistically now than we were decades ago? Good morning. It is definitely a more holistic and comprehensive type of approach. And the idea behind whole health is recognizing that there's more to a veteran's quality of life and their day-to-day overall existence than their experience at the doctor's office, their experience talking to a counselor and the medications that they take. Everything that happens in a veteran's life, waking, sleeping, all of the decisions that we make, the things that we want to do impact our quality of life. And so the idea in whole health is that we're trying to shift and recognize that and offer more opportunities to engage in things beyond traditional medicine. So we're looking at and have been offering those kinds of things like yoga and Tai Chi and Mm -hmm. Qigong and um, different types of experiences. And that's where the Veterans Voices in Literary Cleveland, uh, where we really kind of begin to cross paths because science and research has always shown that getting involved in the creative and expressive arts, whether it's music, uh, painting, sculpture, writing, uh, any of that sort of stuff, helps to keep our minds sharp, helps to keep us, us active and going. And so that's where our approach from the VA side of things is, is to offer our veterans the opportunity to keep their minds sharp, to tell their story, or maybe it's not their story. It's just any story that they want to tell. You want to write about dragons? Cool. We got space for that. You know, all this kind of stuff. And it's veteran focused care. So whatever the veteran wants, whatever they're interested in, we try and seize upon that because ultimately when we know what motivates people and what people want to live for and what they want to be healthy for, we're more successful in providing health care for them. Deborah, let's hear about your time in, in, in the service. Um, and was writing about that time in the service something that um, was helpful for you? Absolutely. So I served for 10 years. Um, I spent two years in Iraq from the time that I 
found out that I was being mobilized until the time that I came home. Mm. That time took 10 years. We were extended while we were overseas. Um, So um, that experience, I think, changed me fundamentally as a person because as a soldier, you always know that there is the possibility for war. The actuality of it can be very different. And so that experience, again, changed me. Um, as Mansa said, I, I felt isolated when I got back to the to the States. I felt distant and disconnected from family and friends because war changes you fundamentally. Oh. Can I have you read um, an excerpt from a, a piece you wrote for the anthology? A- absolutely. The vehicle turns onto the auxiliary road and picks up speed. I tell the eye that I'm going to take the shot. Again, the eye tells me to stand down. I can't. I promise my kids I will come home, and the only thing at the end of the auxiliary road is this tower, my tower guard partner, and me. I have 30 seconds to decide what I plan to hold on to and what I plan to release. I drop the walkie-talkie, aim, and pray. I pray that the driver stops. I pray that he turns around. I pray that I get to go home. My plan is to shoot the tires, disable the vehicle, and then take out the driver. I count one, two, three. The driver comes to a screeching halt. He does a U-turn and races in the opposite direction down the auxiliary road. Minutes later, in the far distance, there's an explosion. And I know. Wow, that's incredibly powerful. And your delivery is so powerful. Um, What was that like? I mean, that's probably one of the more intense experiences and moments of your life um, to be able to kind of articulate that and 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 write in that way and express with others um, in your group. Uh, How did that impact you? So I think that the the benefit of Literary Cleveland veteran voices program is that again it gives veterans an opportunity to be able to share their experiences and that shared experience is both educational and it's also cathartic right so this is an experience that I had that had a tremendous impact on me that I hadn't had an opportunity to fully process until I actually was able to put pen to paper and talk about um, that experience and it was great to be in a space where I felt comforted and where I could share that experience with fellow veterans who understood that perspective. It's nice. I think the benefit of writing is that you get to be heard, um, whether or not that hearing is on paper or whether or not it is um, being vocalized, you get to be heard. And Mansa, do you share in that, that feeling, you know, you both have brought up isolation, but then suddenly you're expressing yourself and it's out there. And yeah. it's going to be received by the person who reads the mm-hmm. anthology or someone you read it to. Yeah. Does that make you feel more a part of? Yeah, definitely. You know, just like the, with the piece we just heard, I experienced the same thing standing in the top guard tower watching this auxiliary road in a different area of course but in terms of just being in a space where people understand something that you cannot tell anyone else Mm -hmm. is very impactful and uh, it's healing and it also is empowering you know we deal with veterans from all um well not all but you know, different war eras. So we did a presentation yesterday with a veteran who was 75 years old, 20 years in the Navy, another veteran, 80 years old. So, you know, for us to be able to convene and commune around our story, it's like we are definitely family as veterans. I think it's amazing too that like, Mm you all have that experience Mm -hmm. and then those of us who are civilians will never have that experience Mm -hmm. and it's important for us to understand the pressure the anxiety the fear Mm -hmm. the terror and how that has shaped you so that we can be empathic right and so that we can sort of be the sort of friends and neighbors and 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 family members supporters and encouragers that we need to be because we'll never be in that situation we can only experience it through your writing yeah Yeah, and i think it kind of adds to your own perspective your respect Mm -hmm. for the enormity of and uh, like you said the pressure um you know i was struck by how 
you you have written about like this very kind of violent b- moment because it it it, it stays with you mm-hmm. and and how to un work through that and you know kind of unpack that must be you know such a hard task in life and to get back to just normal living as we we would call it jeremy i want to ask you know you've got these different vets coming in from different backgrounds serving in different theaters of war um how they can bond over this it's been such an incredible experience for me and i'm a veteran myself and so i uh, I'm really fortunate to be able to straddle this fence because both as a representative of the VA and, and bringing, uh, you know, connecting with this project, but also participating in it. And to have, like Mansa said, our veterans that are in their 70s and 80s that spent time in Korea or Vietnam or dealt with uh, segregation and integration issues and racial challenges in the civil rights era and our female veterans sharing their experiences and uh, you know their uh, their uh, their their biases and the challenges that they faced and that sense of community through challenge and the willingness both in their writing and in talking within their groups and sharing stories to be vulnerable within each other because we all know that it's safe. Mm-hmm. and the support beyond generation that they've all given each other and that we're all giving each other is just such a beautiful thing to see. Mm-hmm. Deborah, do you think you'll keep up with your writing? I mean, how has kind of being involved in this uh, uh, affected you? So, um, yes, I, I definitely plan to keep up with my writing. I have um, several opportunities um, coming up. I've been accepted to the Roca Berry Writers Retreat in France. Um, oh, <laughs> and, ooh la la. <laughs> Great. <laughs> so I'm really excited about that. And um, I have an opportunity coming up to, to do some producing. Um, so I'm really excited about that as well. Um, with respect to the Roca Berry Writers Retreat, I'm especially excited about that because I've written a script about the Korean War. And um, so hopefully that script gets produced and um, people can see it either in streaming or else they can see it in the uh, local movie theater. So my fingers and toes are crossed that that happens. Congratulations on that. Thank you. Michelle, uh, unfortunately, we're running out of time, but I'd love to know um, about the project. Are there is there any um, goals of expanding it and, and how can uh, people find out about how to get involved? Well, the first thing is, if you want to find out more information about Veterans Voices, if you want to join Veterans Voices, please go to uh, Literary Cleveland's website, which is litcleveland.org. Uh, go to the events page and you will see the thumbnail and the link for Veterans Voices. And there, there is a complete description. It talks about exactly what the experience is. There is the schedule for the current fall workshops that will be tying up at the end of November. And we will soon have dates for spring. So we will start up again in January after the holiday. And we usually go for eight weeks and then do another that starts up in March and goes for eight weeks. And we are doing another anthology uh, next year. We're hoping to make them yearly. We're hoping to make them a celebration every year of another successful year of programming. And we are always open for uh, more writers, uh, all ages, like like Mansa said, all branches and all levels of writing experience are welcome. It's absolutely free. All you have to do is bring your sort of talent and your interest. And uh, and we're here. Michelle Smith, Deborah Gibson, Jeremy Stream and Mansa Bay. Thanks to all of you for joining me this morning. Happy mm-hmm. Veterans Day. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Thank you. Time now to take another quick break, but on the other side, we hear from Arthur Fonzarelli himself, Henry Winkler. This is The Sound of Ideas. I'm Jenny Hamill. We'll be right back. It's 945, and you're tuned into The Sound of Ideas right here on WKSU, where support is provided by... University School, offering fully funded four-year scholarships to up to 10 young men entering the ninth grade each year. The Jarvis Scholarship application is now open for 2024 at us.edu. University School, for boys, junior K to grade 12. The Cleveland Orchestra, carols, choirs, and a visit from St. Nick. Holiday concerts with the Cleveland Orchestra and Chorus return this December. Tickets can be reserved now. Presented by CIBC. December 13th through 23rd at Severance Music Center. ClevelandOrchestra.com. 
50 years ago, the Philadelphia Orchestra did something no other American orchestra had done. They went to China. It was an effort to thaw relations between both countries, and this week, they return. Music transcends any kind of politics, any sense of violence in our lives, and we want to continue to bring that to all portions of the world. Our conversation on All Things Considered from NPR News. All Things Considered heads your way this afternoon starting at 4 right here on WKSU. It's the Sound of Ideas from Ideas Stream Public Media. I'm Jenny Hamill. Thanks so much for staying with us this hour. Henry Winkler will forever be known as the Fonz, the super cool greaser from the classic 70s sitcom Happy Days. The man who once inspired kids to get library cards has now written his own autobiography covering a painful childhood, fairy tale romance, and career struggles both before and after his biggest hit. He recently spoke with Ideastream's senior arts producer Kabir Bhatia about his book, Being Henry. Most stories about Henry Winkler's career begin with his time as Arthur Fonzarelli, but his Hollywood career started with a small, memorable guest shot on The Mary Tyler Moore Show. Hi, I'm Steve Waldman. Lou Grant. Murray Slaughter. How are you? Well, fine, fine. I, I just got fired. <laughs> I'm sorry to hear that. Hello, I'm Margaret Geddes. Steve Waldman. Oh, how do you do? Well, I was just fired. <laughs> but this is the way the, that, the, that the town works. I did the Mary Tyler Moore, Moore show on a Friday night. Monday, I met another casting person, and she said, oh, you're Henry Winkler. I went, oh, I'm Henry Winkler. I've only been here for two days. What are you talking about? That's how fast the news goes if you do a good job. It's all in his autobiography, Being Henry, out now. The 77-year-old star moves seamlessly from his personal life to his career and back again, pulling no punches, describing his struggles with dyslexia and his difficult relationship with his parents. I, I hit the ground running because the dream, the intensity, to make it because my father did not want me to be an actor my mother did not want me to be an actor they wanted me to take over the family business i was filled with a a dibbuk a spirit of um a, a thing that is still there that shot me like an arrow i got off the plane with my bags I went to Joan Scott's office on where South Beverly, and I, I thought she, I swear to you, this is how disconnected I was. I thought she was sending me on an audition right then and there. She said, don't you want to get a place to live first? Don't you want to get acquainted? I said, no, I don't. And when I walked into the first audition, the Mary Tyler Moore show, what I was able to do in my work self was completely different than anything I could do in my life self. So I sat down. I talked like I was on fire. Then I emptied the glass of, of pencils. I don't know where it comes from. Clink, clink, clink. When you get a moment, can, can you just pass the salt, put his pencils back in. And, the, and I showed him pictures of the, of like, um, like it really mattered of the shows I did at Yale. What? Oh, he thinks I'm crazy. That's the job. After several appearances on shows for Mary Tyler Moore's production company, he landed on Happy Days. One, two, three o'clock, four o'clock, rock. Five, six, seven o'clock, eight o'clock, rock. Nine, ten, eleven o'clock, twelve o'clock, rock. We're going to rock around the clock tonight. Went to, went to the audition at, at Paramount. All I did was change my voice. I don't know where it came from. I would not have gotten it. In a million years, if I didn't walk in and say, hey, don't look at me like that. Avert your eyes right now. Look at somebody else. Don't you look at me. I didn't know these people. Some of the most famous episodes featured Robin Williams as the alien Mork from Ork visiting from the future. What am I going to be in 1979? Well, Mr. President. <laughs> hey, just kidding. Let's get real about this. <laughs> well, uh, then who is president? Well, you like peanuts? <laughs> Take him or leave him. Then you'll like Jimmy. (laughs) 
you remember Nixon? Oh, yeah, whatever. Don't ask. I see online there's a comedy special of Robbins, and you're sitting in the audience. Stacy and I, we went to see him live. After he was on the show, we went and, and saw him. Now, here is this. This is where I learned one of the, the lessons that I learned to shut up. I said to him, you know, doing a sitcom of your own is so tough. I would not perform at night because you got to use your energy. Now, here is a man who's got more energy than 15, 17 people. His whole life was to do stand up. And I'm telling him to like, you know, I, I would give that up for now. What an idiot. Well, there's a lot of other good advice in the book. Tell me about what it was like to transition on Happy Days to shooting with a live audience. You had done that, but Ron Howard had never done that. Uh, we were almost canceled. There were only 100 shows on at that time, on th- uh, and we were 48. And ABC was not happy enough with with 48. Gary Marshall said, you know, what? we should do it in front of a live audience. You never know. And I'm telling you, Now, Ron Howard was at our table two weeks ago with his wife, who he wasn't married yet when I met them, their daughter, Bryce, who is our godchild, her husband, who I talked about with her in 2000 when I did a Broadway show. She said, I met this guy in my class at NYU. I want to marry him. How do I get him to notice me? How do I get him to see me? 50 years in history, at this table, he said, uh, yeah, you know, you were so good. Uh, and then you were like, uh, from New York? And, and I said, it took you 50 years to tell me this? Ron never had acted in front of a live audience before. Like a duck to water. I'm telling you, you would never have known it. He was smooth as silk, astounding. And then we became acting partners like I've never had before. This is Ron. Is I think the story may be in the book. I, being an intense New York actor, couldn't do a joke. Started to pound the script. He put his arm around me, 10 years younger. Walked me to the back of the soundstage, 24, and said, you know, the writers are working as hard as they could. And uh, I don't think we should hit our script. I said, Ron, I will never hit my script again as long as I live. Nor have I. I'm telling you, wise, this kid. And then he directs you in Night Shift, and then Happy Days ends, and you were kind of in a transitional period, right? Everybody said, what a lovely guy. Oh, he is so talented. Funny, very funny. But he was the Fonz. That was the kiss of death. That's why I became a producer. I wasn't getting hired as an actor. And Night Shift was not the hit. It would become on cable. It was marketed to young people. And it was 18 to 34 that it should have gone to. So I I wasn't getting hired. My lawyer, Skip Brittenham, said, you know, I'm going to start a production company for you. I said, I can't do that. I'm dyslexic. I don't know about business. Yeah, we'll get you a partner and you'll learn. And then the first show that uh, we sold to ABC was MacGyver. Another place you pull no punches in the book is talking about your producing partner who had been the primary director of the Dick Van Dyke show and All in the Family. It's John Rich. From the bottom of my soul, might have been the worst human being I've ever met. It, he was um, he was missing a piece. Very talented. Emmy Award winning, dismissive, disrespectful. I literally walked behind him as he would level anybody and everybody on our crew. And I would say, you know what he really meant was, you're doing a great job. And we really appreciate you. Now, in the book, it seems like it takes a lot for you to get upset about something or at someone, but it's usually centered around some kind of disrespect. Trigger beyond trigger. To dismiss me or not acknowledge me, I will never forget it. 
So at this point, after so many roles on Happy Days and Barry and Arrested Development, is there anything you wish you could have done or that you haven't done yet that you'd like to, like make make a make an album or guest host the Tonight Show, anything like that? Maybe an album. I was approached by these Italian brothers to make an album. They said, I, I said, I can't sing. They said, it's okay. We'll take one note, get it right, and we'll take the next note, get it right, and we'll splice it together. And then the next note, and then the next note, and then we'll have an album. I said, I can't do that. I, that would be a lie. I would be, you know, Milli Vanilli. Maybe my next gig is going to be for PBS, a member of a triumvirate, two ladies and me, uh, Misty Copeland, and I think Connie Chung, uh, recreating the Charlie Rose show, that we would each um, do like 60 interviews. Now, this sounds like a scoop. This is something I haven't heard about before. PBS called. Are you interested? I said, I don't know. I've never done it before, but I think I could do it. And um, so I, I've, they've asked me to do an interview about it. Artists talking to artists. So are there stories that didn't make it into the book that you wish you had included? Do you know what? As quickly as I think of them, I forget them. Think of me as the magic eight ball. And that triangle comes out of the ooze, except my triangle is blank. But that ability to clear your mind and just focus on one thing, that must have at least made you a better actor, right? You know what? It is true because, you know, when you memorize, like, uh, like doing Happy Days, doing Barry, when you do so many episodes in a row, you don't remember anything else except for the immediate, for the moment. When I was in drama school, when I was at Yale, the book was Baba Ramdas, Be Here Now. I didn't completely get it, but what I understood was I have been working to be in the moment. I was not in the moment in the earlier part of my career. So the book is the journey from being who I thought I should be to being authentically who I am, which I'm still on the journey to become. Henry Winkler, thanks so much, and thanks for kind of raising me. Thank, oh, you know what? I, you turned out really great. We're very proud of you, and I'm so happy I got to chat with you. Very fun. That was our own Kabir Bhatia in conversation with actor Henry Winkler, who has a sold-out speaking engagement at the Malt Performing Arts Center tonight at 7.30. Now to get the last word on today's topic, send an email to soi at ideastream.org. We're on Twitter at Sound of Ideas. You can follow me at Jenny Hamill underscore. Yesterday we were having a conversation about issue one and talking about whether that and the vote um, showed that Ohio indeed is not a red state but maybe a purple state. Listener Catherine wrote in and said, I think it's not so much about Ohio being purple. What everyone is ignoring is the possibility that Republicans want abortion rights too. The issue is purple, not the state. Thanks, Catherine, for writing in. Tomorrow on The Sound of Ideas, it's the Friday Reporters Roundtable. Mike McIntyre joined by Stephanie Chekolinsky, Andrew Meyer, State House News Bureau Chief Karen Kastler down at the State House. If you missed any portion of the program, you can find us online or you can listen to the Sound of Ideas podcast. You can also hear a rebroadcast tonight at 9 on 89.7 WKSU on Monday. We're going to talk more about the conflict in the Middle East and how it can trigger and is triggering trauma thousands of miles away. I'm Jenny Hamill. Thanks so much for listening. We'll speak to you again on Monday. You're listening to 89.7 WKSU Kent, a public media service licensed to Kent State University and operated by IdeaStream Public Media.